And uh, I must say, as we start the conference here, isn't it, isn't it terrific to be here, you know, 150 years after the, after the man was born? Here we are in this conference centre named for him, in a futuristic woking, you know, to quote my own title, it really is like something out of H.G. Wells. Um, so I'm going to talk today about um, uh, the... Uh, I've got two parts to my talk, really. I'm going to talk about the influence of the War of the Worlds in particular, for, as seen from my perspective, sort of culturally, uh, and in, a, in a literary sense. Um, but also, I want to, this is an academic conference, so wisely or otherwise, I'm going to try to do some analysis of the War of the Worlds, having worked on it for my sequel, um, uh, as you mentioned, um, and maybe offer my insights into how some of uh, 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 that influence has come about, what Wells did to make the book so memorable. Um, so uh, you can wish me luck with that. Um, I should say, you want to remember, I, I don't have copies of the paper, but I have uh, copies of my references over on the table over there, if you're interested. Um, okay, now Wells's influence uh, uh, was apparent to me, I, th I think it's, it's fair to say, long before I was an NSF, a published SF writer, even before I was an SF reader, as a boy in the 60s, I'm sure my first exposure to Wells was at the movies on Saturday afternoon, you know, the, the War of the Worlds and the Time Machine. And Wells to me was a kind of brand, you know, H.G. Wells as War of the Worlds, at a time when I didn't really understand what a writer was, some kind of godlike artificial entity, probably. Um, uh, and, and there was Wells' name up front and centre, a little bit older when I started reading or discovering uh, uh, the literature for myself at my school library, the local library. Wells was there, in, with the greats like Clark and Asimov, Wells' books were there. You know, Wells may have come in and out of fashion over the years, uh, in, in, in literary circles, but I, can, I think I can say that the, the science fiction community have always cherished him, cherished his work and his memory. Um, uh, and so I became a, an SF writer myself, and as you mentioned earlier, um, Wells had a, a more kind of direct influence on me a bit later uh, when I published my sixth novel, a sequel to The Time Ships, to, to The Time Machine called The Time Ships, um, which was a, another kind of boyhood ambition fulfilled. As a naive 12 year old, the time machine ends on, on this terrific hook, doesn't it? You know, the guy goes off to the future, you never learn what comes next. And I just assumed that there must be a series, sequels are a series, like Barsoom, you know, the ongoing adventures of the time traveller lost in time or something. But no, no such sequel existed until I wrote my own. Well, there the were sequels, obviously, but, but still, but not by Wells. Um, so this was 1995, and I did my best to research the book and the background and Wells and so forth. Um, uh, before, wh while working on my own book. But, but the first time I arrived at the World Society uh, yeah. was at a conference in 1995 on the centenary of the time machine, which was a pretty terrific event. Uh, many of many attendees here were there that day. Um, other luminaries included Brian Aldous, I remember, and Michael Foote. It was terrific to meet Michael Foote, somebody who'd actually met Wells. He'd asked a question when I gave my talk on, on sequels to the time machine. So that was terrific. Um, so that was my introduction to, to Wellesian scholarship, and I think I should, having delved into it all again, I've stayed in touch over the years really for pleasure more than anything, but having delved into it more seriously again for, the, for my War of the Worlds sequel, you know, it's a, it's a remarkable body of work, starting with um, John Hammond founding the Society in 1960, and Bernard Bergonzi's uh, landmark study of the um, uh, scientific romances, pointing out how brilliant they are, essentially. Uh, still a very readable study, I find, as well and all the, all the work uh, uh, that's been done uh, uh, from, from that point to this. Um, but when it came to researching The War of the Worlds so the sequel, I just ignored all that. I couldn't be bothered, I just ignored it, you know. The football was on that day, I could not be bothered. Instead, I just used this. The York Notes Guide to the War of the Worlds. <laughs> Do you remember these things? Uh, study guides, when, if it's your set book for GCSE, you know, or O-level. Uh, this is what you buy as a sort of crammer's guide. Who's the author? Patrick Parinder. <laughs> there, so there you are. So I'm talking about sequels and spin-offs to The War of the Worlds. Here's one. <laughs> uh, published in 1981. Out of print since 1982. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very useful piece of work. It's, got, it's full of, um, among other things, exercises for the reader. Nice specific exercises to make you think, you know, and anticipate the exam questions you're going to face one day. Uh, such as this one, critical assessment. What are the strengths and weaknesses of Wells' book? Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, uh, 
I'll get back to you in 30 years on that one. <laughs> actually, it's very, it was actually very useful. If you want a, a bluffer's guide, a crammer's guide, then you can do a lot worse. But my, so my copy, I, I got it from a, an antiquarian store, <laughs> eBay. Um, but, uh, but the original owner has, has got her name written in, in the inside cover here, Anne Sheridan, 5Z. In, in, a, in a sort of nice, you know, teenager's handwriting, underlined. 5Z, though, she was clearly a high flyer, wasn't she? <laughs> um, but, but I'm not sure if Patrick's work quite held her attention because in the inside cover here, she's written down Anne and Keith. Isn't that nice? Anne and Keith. So there you are. So the War of the Worlds is a saga of interplanetary war, but it sparked a, it sparked a, a teenage romance, you know, as commemorated forever in this, in, the, in this souvenir. You'll have to sign this for me later, Patrick, if you will. <laughs> okay. Um, so, on to the War of the Worlds. Um, so, uh, with the War of the Worlds, Wells, it seems to be, it was like a sort of religious revelation in a way. He injected a whole new set of ideas into our culture, which since then have been worked and reworked. In one of Patrick's papers, actually, he calls the, 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 the dramatizers and the sequel writers and so on myth makers. You know, you take elements from Wells' work and, and, and make myth out of them. Um, uh, of which the most, possibly the most famous or notorious was or Orson Wells' dramatization in 1938. Uh, radio dramatization on the Mercury Theatre of the Air, um, which relocated the War of the Worlds to then present day New Jersey. I think there's some controversy around, uh, it's another myth really, about how much of a panic this thing actually caused, but it does seem that some people believed it. A few people drove to the site where the invasion was supposed to have happened. S there, was some, there were some people who fled Manhattan and so forth, thinking this was real. It may be overblown, but there was some element, I think, of, uh, of, of, uh, of, uh, 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 of the thing being taken seriously at a time when populations were ready to be alarmed, weren't they? Because they were on the brink of the Second World War, after all. Um, but the one point, the, 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 an essential point that Orson Welles saw immediately was that the, the, the core of War of the Worlds is that is, it's about the invasion of the homeland. So Wells was, was, was pricking the conscience of the Imperial British who'd been exporting war for centuries, really, from the homeland and fighting it overseas, all the way back, back to before Napoleon. Uh, uh, so war was a, a foreign thing where you go to build a career. How would it be if it came uh, with devastating effect to the homeland? So Orson Welles relocated to America. And then the movies. I mentioned George Powell's 1953 movie. Once again, we were in America, but that's Cold War America. So this sublimation of Cold War fears, which perhaps comes to a climax in that particular uh, dramatization when nuclear weapons, you know, the great threat and fear and power of the time are used against the Martians, but the Martian machines just glide through. So this is something worse than nuclear war. And Spielberg's 2005 version, well, it's no longer Martians as far as we can tell. These things burst from, the central cities burst from the ground and start laying waste, which is clearly a reference to 9-11. Once again, it's a kind of invasion of the homeland, but now the, the, these are like suicide bomber sleeper cells living among us. Okay, um, so apart from, from these, these dramatizations of, of, of War of the Worlds itself in a direct way, there's a whole legacy of, of uh, invasion from space fiction which followed on. You know, for, with, with Wells, the alien became no longer a merely a sort of philosophical concept, rather like heaven, you know, against which we could measure our own humanity. It became something real and physical that might intervene in our own lives. So, and the list is far too long to, to, to uh, uh, summarize here, but um, uh, the psychological takes on, the, on the, this kind of genre include The Puppet Masters by Heinlein, the 1950s, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, this sort of rather creepy um, um, sub-physical mental invasion. Um, inventive variants included Fred Hoyle's A for Andromeda, which uh, I, remember, I seem to remember very well, but I suspect from reading the, the novelizations broadcast by the BBC in the early 60s, in which the invasion comes by radio waves. We download a signal. It's a very modern concept, really. You download the alien, like an app, which then starts, you know, taking over the world. The sequel to that, actually, Andromeda Breakthrough, is particularly alarming as the thing starts to mess with the climate. Um, we've got a paper, at least one paper, on John Wyndham at this conference. My particular favourite of, of Wyndham's Wellsian, more Wellsian stories is probably The Kraken Wakes, 
uh, the one where they, they land in the sea as opposed to on the land. It's very Wellesian in, the, in, in that the text refers directly to Wells, discusses the Wells invasion as a sort of reference. Um, but well, Wyndham was a deep thinker, it seems to me. Uh, he, talk, you know, he's, he talks about a war between alien intelligences as a new kind of Darwinian conflict. He says, any intelligent form is its own absolute. There cannot be two absolutes. So, you know, he felt that two highly evolved intelligences were bound to come into conflict, for better or worse. And although um, Brian Aldous, for one, always rather looked down on, on Wyndham, in, the, in, in, in print, he, called, he spoke about cosy catastrophes, this kind of cosy middle age, a middle class um, uh, reaction to, to disaster. In private, he called Wyndham boring, I can tell you. <laughs> but I think there was a certain amount of, sort of sibling rivalry going on there. But I never felt that way about Wyndham. This is a generation who, after all, uh, survived the Second World War, coped with the Second World War. So unlike, unlike Wells' readership, his first readership, which were looking ahead to conflicts to come, uh, Wyndham's generation was looking back to a conflict to, which had already survived. So in, in a way, Wyndham's fictions, it seemed to me, were kind of retellings of a story, a nightmare they had already survived. A way of coming to terms with the thing, in a way. It seems, it seems to me no, no uh, surprise that Wyndham was the most popular SF writer with, of his generation in Britain, at least. Um, so so I, I said that the, the, the core, it seems to me, of Wells' fiction was to bring the invasion to the homeland, and so if you're rewriting, you, you, you bring it to your homeland. However, the English setting of, 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 of Wells' original story sticks in the mind as well, because he made it so specific. Part of the art, of course, uh, uh, as we know, Wells researched the, the locations and the timelines and so forth very, seri very carefully to give a sense of realism, what we'd now call faction, you know, make a fiction spiced up as fact to give it authenticity. Um, and, 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 and the setting in itself inspired an interesting British substrand sub of invasion stories set in the home counties or London. So Quatermass, for instance, you know, which, which heavily, heavily influenced by Wells, which then heavily influenced Doctor Who. So it's really Doctor Who, uh, Wells' fault to think that in Doctor Who, London in particular gets hammered over and over by wave after wave of alien invasions, mostly on Christmas Day. <laughs> Okay, so, so that's a, a, a kind of indirect legacy of Wells, this, this creation of the alien invasion narrative. But, the, but Wells' own universe uh, continues to intrigue, so, you know, as I know with my, with my own sequel now. But I'm sure you know that the first sequel to, to, to The War of the Worlds was published even before Wells' definitive novel version uh, by Garrett Service in America. And I think I can summarise this best by just reading his title, his full title. Garrett P. Service, Edison's Conquest of Mars. How the people of all the Earth, fearful of a second invasion from Mars, under, under the inspiration and leadership of Thomas A. Edison, the great inventor, combined to conquer the warlike planet. Which is terrific. So this ran as a serial, uh, almost concurrently with the serialisation of Wells in, in, in America. So you can tell from the, from the title of the terms, quite different from... From, from Wells, as Wells was, was aiming for a sense of helplessness before this onrushing juggernaut. But not the Americans, they weren't having that. Um, uh, uh, clearly, service thought that the Bostonians of 1898, where he first published, were, you know, they were, they were a much more exuberant lot than that. And here's one quote Even while the Martians have been upon the earth, a feeling, a confidence had man manifested itself in France, to a minor extent in England, and particularly in Russia that the Americans might discover the means to meet and master the invaders. Hurrah! Which, of course, they do in the book. Okay. Um, a, a question, another question left un, un, unanswered by Wells' book is what's happening in the rest of the world? We see an invasion of, of, of England. Uh, the, the, the narrator of the, of the book, who I'll return to, kind of hints at a global, it's the war of the worlds, after all. But what happened in the rest of the world uh, what effect would the invasion have had if, if it had landed, if, if the Martians had come to America, or Russia, or China, or India? One interesting uh, um, study of this is, is a collection called uh, War of the World's Global Dispatches, edited by Kevin J. Anderson, published in 1996, in which he got... Uh, a, 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 it's a montage of, of contributions by various writers, from Robert Silverberg through to Walter John Williams, um, uh, who contributed... Stories about um, um, 
historical and fictional characters from around the globe with, with different perspectives on the Martian invasion. And you do get a sense of the wider um, uh, impact of the invasion uh, and, uh, and, and the, the general contact with Mars that, uh, that, that might have come about. All, all these works are kind of like cracked mirrors, it seems to me, which, which show a different angle on the original and, 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 uh, and, and help you in understand some of the themes. So, for example, you've got a young Teddy Roosevelt in Cuba witnessing an invasion there. Um, you've got Joseph Pulitzer uh, looking at landings in Missouri. Mark Twain witnesses assaults in New York. And Mark Twain says, a Martian is as ugly as a capitalist, which is a, is a, a nice line. Uh, Walter John Williams, his story is particularly interesting. There's China, which was already suffering wave after wave of invasion from, from foreign devils. To them, the Martians were a kind of relief because they drew away, you know, the, the English and the Americans to fight elsewhere. Um, Tolstoy and Lenin, uh, they, they watch the Martians assault Russia and you get a kind of earlier version of the revolution. Uh, so, it seems to be a kind of um, consensus emerges from this that there will be, even assuming that the Martians don't stay around to dominate the world, there will be such turmoil, such upheaval, there will be political and social transformations, some of which were like what happened in the real world, some of which maybe weren't. Injection of technology would change our world, surely, if we got hold of the Martians' uh, heat ray and so forth. Um, and, uh, and, and as Wells himself hints in his epilogue to the book, this, a great philosophical and scientific transformation would surely come about, suddenly knowing that we're not alone in the universe. That, simple, that one simple fact alone would, 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 would change everything about the way we look at ourselves, I think. Um, Scholar Traces, a graphic novel published in 2003, uh, another sequel to The War of the Worlds. In this case, 10 years after the fall of the Martians, Britain has got hold of the technology. Uh, so it's used from everything from, from they use heat rays for central heating, um, you've got eight-legged spider cabs running along the streets in London. Kind of, it's kind of sort of uh, steampunkish. Um, but the, the British Empire has become the envy of the world, armed with Martian technology. The envy of the world, or rather feared by it. And the hero is a sort of dissident to all this. And he says, he wonders if, while the Martians are thwarted, we have in some insidious way succumbed to form a conquest by proxy. So this injection of... of, of, of Technology for which we are not ready, probably, has conquered us in a, in a more subtle way. Um, and um, uh, what if they came again, as they do in my sequel? Uh, another of my uh, favourite sequel series, really, is, is Kill Raven, which is a Marvel Comics series, which is full of blood and guts and thunder and so forth. But it's, but it's, but, but it's actually very well, uh, Wellsian. Kill Raven, it's a century or so after the, after the Wells invasion, uh, 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 has happened, the Martians return, having sorted out the business with the bacteria, take over, and, and we have a playing out of the kind of vision the artillery man proposes in, in the book, if you remember. They're, they're farming us, they're keeping us as stock animals, but they also kind of play with us, they have gladiatorial contests and so forth. And that's what Kill Raven is, he's the gladiator who, who emerges, rather like Commodus, you know, in the Whistle Crow movie, to take on the authorities, in this case the Martians. Okay. Uh, another use to which Wells' text has been put over the years is what's called recursive fiction, in which, in, which you, in which you mash up the War of the Worlds with other stuff, either taken from Wells' wider work or from other fictions. Christopher Priest, another vice president of the Society of the Space Machine, highly enjoyable book, which is a really a mashup of the time machine with the War of the Worlds. So in this book, um, a, a, a young flirtatious but very awkwardly diffident Edwardian couple, young couple, uh, get hold of a time machine, but it, 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 this thing translates you in space as well as time, and they end up on Mars as the Martians prepare for the invasion. So you see this kind of Wellsian, Bosumian Mars. They stow away in a cylinder back to Earth uh, during the invasion. There they meet H.G. Wells, who's got another version of the time machine, uh, which and they fly around bombing the Martians and so forth. It's really quite a... Everything Chris does works on many levels, and this is really a satire, I think, of Edwardian mores. You know, the, the woman's taken to Mars, and she's, she struggles for the first few days until she finally, as they're wandering through the wilderness, you know, until she finally takes off her corset. <laughs> uh, and then she's kind of gets a liberation that way. Um, 
Uh, yes, but mashups with other sorts of fiction. Sherlock Holmes more than once has, has taken on the Martians. Of which my favourite is uh, Sherlock Holmes' War of the Worlds by uh, a, a father and son writing team called Manly Wellman, Wellman and Wade Wellman. Uh, in which um, you get Holmes and Professor Challenger, so another of Conan Doyle's uh, heroes, running around in the, in, in the uh, circumstances of the Martian invasion. I don't think they much, make much difference to the invasion and its outcome. But you do get a different point of view, at least, uh, of, of what's going on. More graphic novel fun is The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, volume two of that series by Alan Moore and Kevin O'Neill, in which you have this league of superheroes, really, Victorian age superheroes, uh, all brought together in the same reality. So you've got Quatermain, uh, Jekyll and Hyde, Captain Nemo, uh, characters from Dracula, uh, The Invisible Man, they all get together and they're in, in a team controlled by Mycroft Holmes, you know, Sherlock's smarter brother. And they take on the Martians, and it's terrific. You've got, this is a graphic novel, remember, so it's halfway to a movie. You've got, you've got the Nautilus smashing up Martian war, Martian war machines in the Thames. And Mr. Hyde, right, wrestles a tripod to the ground and eats a Martian. You know, you, you couldn't make it up. Well, actually, somebody did make it up. But it's, it's, but it's terrific. And in the end, Dr. Moreau is, is, uh, is a... Uh, um, uh, you develops a biological weapon, an anthrax-based bug, which is the bug that beats the, Mar beats the Martians in the end. I think if there's, a, if there's a moral to this, it's that we have to draw on our own evil genius, you know, to beat the greater evil genius of Martians. Uh, maybe my own single favourite of, of, uh, of these mashups is when Superman met the Martians. Uh, Superman are one of my boyhood heroes. Uh, so it's, this is set in 1938, so at the time of Orson Welles' invasion, and the Martians land on the outskirts of Metropolis. So there's, you've got the Man of Steel battling the Martian invaders, but Luther naturally collaborates with the Martians. Um, uh, uh, I, think, I think the most interesting thing about this is, it, it's published in 1999, by which time the, the comics of books have, have grown up, you know, you get quite, quite deep inspections of how would it be to have an alien running around amongst us? And although Superman drives away the aliens, the, 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 the people of Earth remain suspicious of Superman. We've got one, one alien battling another bunch. And Superman says in the end, uh, if the Martians hadn't come, the people of Earth might have ended up running away from me. Even Lois Lane turns away from him in the end. So that's, that's, that's interesting. However, that, that was not, I found, I found it quite recently, it was not Superman's first contact with H.G. Wells and his universe. Um, the, the, a story in Superman number 62 in 19, published in 1950. I think if I just read you the blurb to this story, you'll get the idea. What on earth, or should we say what on Mars, is Orson Welles doing wearing that outlandish ancient costume and dueling with the fantastic huge-headed huge inhabitants of another planet? It all started when the movie Black Magic, starring Orson Welles, was being filmed. In a firecracker series of fantastic events that fired Orson Welles to Mars. Here he found himself fighting frantically to warn the world of a Martian invasion, this time a real one. But the world laughed, for this was the second time that Orson was crying wolf. Only Superman, to whom another planet is as close as the house next door, realised the danger. Then Orson Welles and the Man of Steel formed a two-man alliance to fight the desperate world-saving battle of black magic on Mars. Which is great. And I must say, Orson Welles has never looked more good-looking than in, the, in, his, in his comic version in, in the... Okay. Well, of course, uh, uh, the alien invasion in the, in the wider uh, fictional world continues to this day. Independence Day resurgence. Uh, and I've got a couple of quotes from that movie, which I quite, I quite enjoyed, actually. You know, you've got, you got to sort of go with the flow. But uh, there's a Welles in quote from the president, not that president, Mr. President. Uh, Patrick back there, but pre <laughs> the president in the movie, in which he says, On this day in 1996, the world escaped the clutches of extinction, but in their sacrifice we found the technology to bring a strong and safer earth because our survival is our only possible when we stand together. Which is, a, you know, not a bad uh, 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 legacy of Wells in its way. Although, at one point, another character says, Time to kick some serious alien ass. <laughs> Which is a bit more Garrett's service, isn't it, than H.G. Wells? <laughs> um, okay, but no, so, so that's Wells' literary influence. His influence in the wider world uh, seems pretty clear to me, um, both in terms of his, his, his uh, uh, showing us a mirror to our own humanity, on the one hand, 
um, and our, relation, our relationship with the putative alien. Um, I, th I think I was really struck, and you, even having worked on Wells, Wells, Wells related materials for so long, uh, by his influence on um, the mind of the common man and woman, if I can put it that way, when I worked on a book on the Second World War of my own called Weaver, 2006, Ultimate History in which the, the Nazis invade Southern England. Um, and I, so I researched um, occupation accounts from France and Belgium and so forth, the, the Channel Islands. Uh, uh, I went accounts as far as I could get, get to them. And I was very struck, actually, just in passing, how, by how often people say, would say things like, it's just like something out of H.G. Wells, which is my title. You know, the onrushing blitzkrieg in France, just like something out of H.G. Wells, the sense of being a helpless population in the face of mechanised warfare, moving at speed, you know. I mean, Wells foresaw this in terms of the First World War with the Zeppelin raids, and, and, and but also looked ahead, in a way, to the Second World War, quite remarkably. Um, and possibly a, 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 a key note, um, summary of that theme, is a book by Nal Ferguson, published in 2006, called The War of the World, which is a history of the Second World War, but opened out into this wider context as part of what he called a, uh, the Age of Hatred, spanning much of the 20th century. So the conflicts that preceded and followed the Second World War itself. And he uses the, the, the War of the Worlds as a, as a sort of controlling metaphor for the whole thing. He, says it's a he calls it a work of singular prescience. In the century after the publication of his book, scenes like the ones Wells imagined became a reality in cities all over the world. And so it goes on today. I came across a book recently, published in 2015, called Zeppelin Blitz by a writer called Neil Storey. And it, it, its blurb opens like this. In 1907, H.G. Wells published a science fiction novel called The War in the Air. It proved to be portentous. In the early years of the First World War, German lighter than air flying machine Zeppelins attacked the British mainland. So, so Wells is used as a reference by historians, but also by, by, by uh, eyewitnesses and victims, if you like, of the turmoil of the, of the 20th century. And I like to, to imagine that perhaps they found some comfort in some way in knowing that Wells had been there imaginatively before. You know, these the horrors have been framed by at least one mind before they arrived in Paris or, or London. Okay, so that's our, Wells's influence on, on, on the realm of humanity, but what about his, his, uh, his, his influence on our um, uh, relationship to the alien? Um, first attempts to respond to the alien arriving on the planet don't go too well in the War of the Worlds, do they? But there's this initial impulse, a Wellsian impulse, to make contact. You know, you call Ogilvy, who's commemorated in this building, approaching the, um, uh, the, the Martian cylinder with a, a, a white flag of peace and so forth. In the movie, it's a, a, it's a, there's, a, there's a, a Christian with a Bible in there as well, as I recall. And their reward is a dose of heat ray. Um, but how do we approach the alien? Well, this is, this is taken more seriously now ever since SETI got going, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, which is the radio astronomers, you know, looking for signals from the sky, um, since 1960. Uh, from the beginning of that effort, which was taken pretty seriously, there seemed no reason to suppose that radio noisy civilizations like ours might not be, you know, if not in the solar system, scattered throughout the nearby stars. The, the, the likelihood of contact or at least detection of a signal was taken pretty seriously. And the implications of, of such a contact or detection were taken seriously too and explored in various academic groups. Now SETI continues today, and it, it, in terms of, of, of its academic hierarchy, it's controlled by the International Academy of Astronautics, which has a permanent committee uh, overseeing, if you like, SETI events. They meet once a year, there are papers on SETI, uh, and so forth. This committee has a subcommittee called the Post-Detection Task Group, which is tasked specifically with, with trying to work out the implications of a, of a contact or a detection event, um, on which I have, of which I am a member, for better or worse. They've had science fiction writers involved since the beginning of this thing, back in the n early 90s, I think, and I'm the latest uh, uh, victim. So um, I, it's fascinating to be involved in, you can imagine, You're looking at all aspects of, 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 of how to manage I think the most interesting case is how to manage a friendly scene in contact. You know, in a way, a straightforward hostility would be easy at conceptual at least to, 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 to get your head around, but a friendly contact, can you trust it? Is it deception? 
even it's benevolent, is it going to, it is going to perturb our society in some way? Um, so, it's, it, so it's terrific. So you, you may or may not be, be uh, reassured to know that if the aliens land, there was at least one Wellesian who would be, you know, in the first <laughs> of, 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 uh, of, of... I'll probably get them to sell my copy of War of the Worlds. Okay, now, um, I, I, I'm running slightly short of time, but I want to try to uh, move on a bit now to my analysis of War of the Worlds. Mm -hmm. uh, whatever you think of sequels uh, uh, to, to these works, by the other hand, what you do get is a creative writer looking hard, if you take it seriously, looking hard at, um, uh, in this case, the War of the Worlds, this novel. I looked at the critical editions, which include early drafts and so forth. I'm trying to understand how Wells constructed his book and how he made the choices he made. Because you see, a, a, a novel is not um, something you can hold in your head all at once at the beginning and then kind of transcribe. It doesn't work like that. You have a vision of some kind. Writers work differently, but in my case at least, you have a vision of some kind of roughly what the themes are, what the story is going to be, what it's going to be about, and then you do and you, you do your best to go for it, construct some kind of first draft, putting together the narrative, and then work out what worked, what didn't work. Second draft, change things, cut things, deepen things, and so forth. And, uh, and it's it's more a, 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 it's almost like more like discovery than construction in a way, because fiction is. It has to work on a, on a, a tension between the, the conscious and the subconscious for the reader and for the writer as well. So you have to think of the young Wells, you see, in Woking in 1895-67, working on the War of the Worlds and, and in a way struggling with it. He's struggling to, through his drafts, uh, to, to um, uh, uh, get to the, the deeper truths he wants to portray. And in particular, if you go through the drafts, uh, such as they exist, I think what does evolve very clearly is the character of the narrator in a very interesting way. Now, could, uh, uh, is he a controversial figure, the narrator? Patrick wrote a, a, a paper which caught my eye and, and led me down this, 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 uh, this path in 2000 called How Far Can We Trust the Narrator of the War of the Worlds? And we, we, when he, 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 Patrick referred to Orson Welles and the other myth makers of, of, of the, the War of the Worlds, and he says, the first of all the myth makers who have re rewritten the Martian invasion is Wells as narrator. So he's implied that the narrator is not just unreliable, he's actually rewritten the events in some sense. Leon Stover wrote a, a very stimulating uh, critical edition, much of which I disagreed with, but he loathes the narrator. He says, among many other insults, he, 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 say, he says he, he's a lightweight intellectual associated with Dr. Pa Pangloss. Not everything he says is reliable, however authoritative or authoritative he pretends to be. He's but a pale imitation, if not a parody of Wells, who's the true intellectual on the philosophy of science. Well, I wasn't convinced by that because why would Wells have a fool and a weakling as his central character? Flawed, maybe, but not, uh, not such a twerp, perhaps. Well, I think you if you look through the, the, the drafts as they exist, you have manuscript fragments on the one hand, you have the Pearson's uh, publication, the magazine publication, and the final novel, ver novel version. We don't have complete drafts, you know, if ever such things existed, but you can trace, I think, the evolution of the, of the story and the narrator, um, uh, as well as worked his way through the drafts. Um, and I think he began with a vision of, of, the, of the kind of narrator he'd evolved uh, in The Time Machine, his first novel, and in the short stories, which is a kind of quasi-omniscient narrator. Because, uh, just to quote the famous first paragraph of the War of the Worlds, which is compulsory for anyone giving a paper on the War of the Worlds, you have to, you have to do the Richard Burton bit. <laughs> no one would have believed in the last year of the 19th century that this world was being watched keenly and closely by intelligences greater than man's, yet as mortal as his own, that as, as men busied themselves about the various concerns, they were scrutinised and studied almost as narrow, narrowly as a man with a microscope might scrutinise the transient, scru transient creatures that swarm and multiply. With infinite complacency, men went to and fro over this globe about their little affairs, serene in their assurance of their empire over matter. You see, how can anybody embedded in the story know that, right? How could they know what's going on across the planet, let alone what was going on on Mars? So this feels like an omniscient narrator. However, in the second paragraph, we get the pronoun I. The planet Mars, I scarcely need remind the reader, rewards around the sun at a mean distance, of, and so on and so on. So this is a, this is a character who's in the story but Wells had evolved a, 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 what I think was a quasi-omniscient narrator. We have a journalist of a kind who has had time to, like a historian, he's had time to research the events, make guesses 
about what was going on elsewhere, at least informed guesses, consult the experts and so forth, and ladle all this into his personal account. So it's a kind of informed historical memoir. Okay, so this is a good way to tell a story, but Wells also used this as a way to uh, bring some authenticity uh, to the story, additional authenticity, because his narrators were often skeptical. And one, ex one simple example comes from the time machine, here you've got the time traveller try trying to convince us, the reader, of this fantastic story of his journey into time, of which he's come back with no evidence, as far as you can see. You know, he comes back looking a bit beat up, but he could have slept on horse or common for a week. You know, um, he, he didn't think to take a camera, uh, and yet his claims have gone off to the year 800,000. But as he goes through his account, he, sees, he says, oh, by that, that reminds me, he's talking about Wiener putting flowers in his pocket, uh, and he digs into his pocket, silently, silently placed two withered flowers, not unlike very large white mallows, on the little table. He resumed his narrative. Later on, the time traveller himself begins to lose faith in his own story. I, I hardly believe it myself. And yet, his eye fell with the meeting quarry upon the withered white flowers. The medical man rose and examined the flowers. He says, it's a curious thing. I don't know the natural order of these flowers. Where did you really get them? Uh, and so on. You think the flowers are a kind of literary device because at the end of the book, those are the flowers stand as a metaphor for the heart of mankind in the future. In fact, it's all a con trick. You know, the guys produce these dodgy looking flowers and that's what convinces you there's trouble in time, this one detail. And if you look through worlds of stories like um, the case of Davidson's eyes, he does the same thing. Some, some detail, it's, it's rather like Columbo asking just one more question, you know. Uh, just, I don't really believe any of this, but there's just one detail that doesn't quite fit and because you've got a sceptical observer who himself becomes sceptical of his own scepticism, you believe it, if you see what I mean. So I think that was the role, you see, of the narrator in Wells' original zeroth draft, if you like. He was going to be this kind of disengaged observer. And indeed, he, he does give us this kind of observation when he's watching the Martians from the ruined house in Sheen. He talks about his theory of telepathy. The Martians are telepathic. And he says this, um, I'm convinced of this because of my observations. In spite of strong preconceptions, before the invasion, um, I'd written with some little vehemence against the telepathic theory. So he's kind of arguing against himself, you see, which makes you more convinced that what he's seen is, is authentic. Okay. However, you can't really write a, a, a novel about an alien invasion and have a disengaged inver observer in there, because the very minimum he's going to do is be running away the whole time from the Martians. So the narrator need, needs some kind of story. Right, now I think what we, we have, this is my... This is a hypothesis, really, which is consistent, I think, with the draft as they exist, of, of a kind of first draft-ish version of the, 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 the story as uh, the narrator uh, uh, experienced it, um, compared to the final draft of the story that we're familiar with. The, the details of the Martian invasion don't change very much. What, what happens to the narrator does, okay? So draft, draft one, this is Wells looking for the story, remember. The Martians land in Woking, or nearby, and the narrator, the narrator sees the early landings and so forth. He goes back to his wife, takes his wife to, to Leatherhead, to the cousin's house in, in the cart. So that's as we know it. But then, he, then he goes back to Woking uh, to return the cart, and he just wants to see what's going on. In this early version, he then goes back to Leatherhead. He does the sensible thing. He goes back to Leatherhead to get to his wife, only to find Leatherhead's been destroyed, apparently his wife killed by the Martians. Q, grief and rage. So he, fo he starts to follow the Martian invasion and he comes upon, not the artillery man and so forth, a resistance fighter, a kind of warlord type called Marriott, who is, uh, this is after the collapse of government really in the country. And Marriott, unlike the artillery man who's a dreamer, really, um, he's done something. He's organised uh, a local community. It's, pro it's rather sinister. He's controlling the food supply and so forth. Um, but he's fighting back against the Martians. He's got sticks of dynamite and so forth, he's actually hitting back. So the narrator, motivated by grief and rage, becomes a kind of um, uh, a suicide bomber. He takes some, some explosives from Marriott, he goes in search of the Martians in London, meaning to blow himself up and take a Martian with him. Um, only to find, of course, in London that the Martians have been uh, slain already by the bacteria. So there you've got this, he, he's driven by grief and rage, he's come a long way from the philosophical journalist he, be, uh, he began life as, He's become a suicide bomber, but at least this is a, he's a purposeful, strong character um, uh, 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 with a single purpose through this narrative. 
However, Wells clearly wasn't happy with that, and the final reversion we, we, we get in the novel is, is quite different. So he, we begin in the same way, Martians land, uh, narrator takes us back to Leatherhead, comes back, um, and, and he means to go back to Leatherhead. Throughout the book, he means to go back to Leatherhead, but he, he is easily dissuaded them after artillery man says, well, it's dangerous, let's, let's do a detour. He starts to follow the Martians, not east to Leatherhead, but north towards Weybridge and so forth, gets caught up in the fighting there. He keeps on insisting he wants to get to Leatherhead, but he keeps on going north after the Martians. He gets caught up in the collapsed house, of course. He gets caught up with the artillery man. He ends up burned. Um, he kills the curate, of course. He kills a man to ensure his own survival. Ends up traumatised, wandering into London. Again, he's suicidal, but this time he's not meaning to take a Martian with him. He's going to expose himself to the heat ray, really, only to find the Martians have been killed already. So I think this is where the problem with the narrator comes. He, his, his, his conscious purpose is quite different from what he does on the ground. Um, he describes himself, just quickly going through some symptoms here. Even before the invasion, he's a man of exceptional moods with a kind of detachment from humanity. When he's thinking about this conflict between the drive to go to Leatherhead to the wife and after the Martians, he says, it's a curious thing, I feel angry with my wife. I can't account for it, but my impotent desire to reach Leatherhead worried me excessively. He's a philosophical journalist who writes about moral relativism and stuff. He, uh, so he, he should be beyond religion in a sense, but after he's killed a man, uh, so this is a shocking thing to have had to do to survive, Shock, more shocking ethically than killing a Martian. He uh, turns back to God. Do you recall he prays in the night, he comes to an atonement with God, it's this kind of primitive Christianity, he falls back, contradicting everything in his previous life, probably. And at the end, after he's found the Martian slain, now comes the strange thing in my story, for of the next three days I know nothing. I've learned since, so far, a bit, uh, he, he wanders around basically and take, until he's taken in by a kindly couple and looked after. He goes through a three-day fugue. And I, I would suggest that what's going on here is that he's, he's suffering from that, what we would now call shell shock, or something like it, a civilian version of shell shock. A term that wasn't coined until, uh, by the medics until World War I, uh, but the, the symptoms were recognised as early as the US Civil War, um, as a form of neurasthesia, they called it then. And symptoms include uh, paralysis and nightmares and a sensitivity to noise and a fugue and hallucinations. You may recall that after the war, Wells says he, he goes into London and busy streets and so forth. All he sees is desolation and the dead and so forth of, of, of previous times. So I think what Wells was groping for, not just a prediction of mechanised warfare, but a prediction of um, uh, shell shock as well. Why did he do this and why did he grope for this? Why did he abandon the earlier kind of more purposeful eraser? I think it's because he wants to increase the shock. You know, he's, he's, he put the Martians up here as an overwhelmingly horrifying force, and by putting human reaction down here, he's increased the depth of the shock and the impact of the work. And I, 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 standing here now in Woking, I'd like to think about this, you think about this young chap, he's, he's, he's only 30-ish, he's suddenly successful, he's selling everything he writes, the more he writes, the more he sells, it would have been tempting for him to sort of dash off a quick draft and move on to the next project to earn more money, but no, he went over it and over it and over it until he was happy with the, with the, the, the depth of the work. So that's how I think he achieved the, the effect that he did and how he, he came to, perhaps in an instinctive way, to de de develop the uh, artistry of which Bernard Bergonzi spoke about uh, all those years ago. So I think my, my conclusion from all that was that Bernard Bergonzi was right. Thank you. <laughs>